Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to attend Intercon Integrated Defense Solutions, IDS for short, hosted webinar as we discuss the importance of power integration. I'm your host, Sean Lott. I am the Director of Business Development at Intercon IDS. Joining us today, we have an esteemed power integration panel with over 120 years of combined experience. Before we get started, you can ask questions to the panelists by clicking the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. All questions will be answered after the last panelist has concluded. As a reminder, this session is being streamed live on Facebook at Intercon Engineering, as well as being recorded for on-demand viewing at a later date. Kicking things off for us this morning, we have Nick Kieber. Nick is the Vice President for Intercon IDS. His business unit specializes in providing U.S. defense partners with power integration and enclosure solutions. Nick has 21 years of power integration and packaging experience. His business unit currently produces the Power Prime unit for THAAD Missile Defense System in support of the Missile Defense Agency's Ballistic Missile Defense Strategy. Without further ado, Mr. Kieber. Thank you, Sean, and thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. So when you think about uh, tactical power solutions, one of the things that we notice is companies tend to put them further back in their development processes because they're typically focused on their core technology first. So whether that's sensors or base solutions, um, power tends to fall to the back. And some of the challenges with that is you can result in either having an underfunded program because you didn't plan properly for your tactical power needs, and you can end up adding significant level of resource needs to your program to make up for those deficiencies. One of the uh, challenges with that is that you're gonna end up losing customer confidence because as those challenges happen, schedules will be delayed, um, you will may fail to meet some of your specification requirements, and it is very much a uh, important factor. So, and most importantly, you know, the warfighter is gonna receive a solution that is not sustainable and survivable, and that's what we ultimately care about is putting the best equipment in our warfighter's hands that we can. All right. So when we think about what are the major engineering considerations for a tactical generator? First is the generator set selection. The generator is the heart of the power system. Uh, Bucky Brennan is going to talk more about that with us today and why it's important to con consider your gen set selection early in the process. Next are cooling requirements. Generator sets need to be cooled and you need to be able to move a lot of air to be able to cool them. And that's something Hans is gonna speak with us about um, from IEA here in a little bit as well. And further is uh, environmental considerations. Uh, you can see in the photo in the top right, that's a package we did from McMurdo Station in Antarctica and the blue package at the end there. And you can be in harsh environments with severe cold or severe heat. All of those things are gonna impact how your power system's designed as well as high altitude, which Bucky will talk about here in a little bit. And if it's sitting next to the ocean in a very saline environment, uh, that has an impact on the survivability of the equipment as well and things you need to consider in the design. Further, transportability methods need to be considered. Uh, you know, from our experience, if larger power systems, you're limited on your height by the NATO envelope B tunnels in Europe, and you're limited on your ground clearance from the roll on roll off fast ships ramp angle. So that kind of dictates the overall height of your package and then the minimum uh, ground clearance that you need in the bottom. So you're kind of honed into a little box to start out with and then you need to get creative with your engineering to make everything else work. Sound attenuation is a consideration as well. These are large diesel engines. They produce a lot of sound, whether it be from an OSHA standpoint to protect the warfighter's hearing or it, whether it's a mission requirement to reduce the sound print in the battlefield. Control systems are important as well. So not only do you need to interface with the generator set to control uh, uh, power and also be able to parallel with other generator sets, things like that, but you also may have a fault detection and isolation requirement that allows the warfighter for ease of uh, identifying faults quickly in the process. 
and then being able to replace those in the field. Further EMI and hemp hardening, you'll hear a little bit about this from Jay uh, Harrelson over at Celtron today. Uh, it can be a challenge depending on the level you require in your program. This is something that we see is uh, oversaw, over, uh, missed regularly because uh, you may need to have conductive um, gasketing and a flame spray surface in between every mating panel to maintain that conductivity so we can't have any EMI links leaks for hemp. Uh, everything has to be grounded with these large ground straps, everything that's mated together. So there's a uh, significant investment in that. For airflow, you may need EMI screens to be able to handle all that air. And sometimes, as you'll hear from Hans, we're moving over 100,000 CFM worth of air, so that adds more restriction to the system. So there's a significant uh, need to consider that early in your process. For the CBRN a washdown, which is a chemical, biological, radiation, and nuclear washdown, uh, you need to make sure that you use coatings that are appropriate, like a cark paint. Also, um, as Jay Harrelson over at Celtron will speak about here in a little bit, you need to have um, special uh, coatings uh, that are in there for like EPDM for jacketing on your cables. And some materials you just can't use in those environments. So that's going to be considered as well. Further in placement time, uh, you know, the warfighter has a mission to complete and whether in placement's 10 minutes, an hour or two days, uh, depending on your program, that needs to be considered early in the design process to make sure the equipment will meet it. And maintenance, these generators need uh, maintenance regular at intervals. So you wanna be able to make that as expeditiously as possible. So that way there's less downtime uh, at certain intervals. So you need to consider all of that in your specification as well. So with that, I think you're going to hear a lot from the following uh, folks about how to um, plan for these tactical power solutions, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from them. Awesome, Nick. Appreciate it. So next up, we have our second briefer. We have Mr. Bucky Brennan. Bucky is the Gas Energy Business Development Manager for Milton Cat, an industry leader in prime and standby power generation and engines. Bucky has 37 years of experience within Caterpillar Power Systems discipline with an emphasis in business development and project management of complex generator set systems. So Mr. Brennan, over to you. Thank you, Sean. Um, thanks everyone for uh, getting together with us today. You know, everybody uh, goes online these days uh, to do searches for all sorts of things, whether you're buying a car or a refrigerator uh, a bicycle, whatever, you start looking to see what your options are. Same thing goes for uh, generators today. We used to have, you know, catalogs that were in somebody's office, but today it's all online. So you can go online at a, a generator dealer and you can uh, plug in your KW and you can come up with uh, a particular size generator that you might be looking for. And uh, you can select an engine generator set and now those generator sets will have a range of output depending on uh, the application and they'll have a, a different kind of emission strategies and those all affect uh, what you might choose for your generator set. So now we're going to touch on some of the things that can impact uh, the sizing of your generator set that you might be picking for your tactical project. So you're going to have a mission power requirement. You know that from your other end items that might be driving the KW of the system that you think you're looking for. But, uh, you know, so if you're selecting a thousand KW generator set, because that's what all your end items need for power, you have to consider all, a bunch of different criteria uh, that can impact um, the out, total output at the end of the day of what that generator is capable of doing. One of the big items is always uh, ambient temperature. Your, your tactical mobile generator system uh, will probably likely be transported to all different regions, including around the world. So a lot of times we see 50 degrees C, 55 degrees C as the requirement for that. Um, and that temperature is gonna affect um, the cooling system, the amount of air you can get into the into the unit, and uh, Hans will talk a little bit later about how that affects the the cooling system. Um, that could also cause a derate of the engine. Altitude's another one. 
Um, many times, the, in combination with uh, ambient temperature, uh, the requirements will be high altitudes. And that, again, has a dramatic impact on the um, KW output of the generator set. So now, you, you know, you said you're picking a 1,000 KW generator. You could already be ratcheting back now to that machine only being able to do under those two requirements like 900 kW or 850 kW. Another one is the fuel type. Most all, all products when you're going online looking up the rating, those are all based on uh, diesel number two, standard diesel fuel. But most tactical projects uh, requirements want to have uh, a fuel that's useful on all the end items that might be in the field, the, the transport vehicle, et cetera. So sometimes, a lot of times we'll see JP8, things like that. Different fuel types are gonna, again, derate the iron that you might be picking and the KW that you're gonna end up with. And then, you know, uh, today emission requirements on vehicles and generator sets uh, is an important criteria that we have to meet to be able to go into different countries and different regions. If you end up having to have a tier four requirement for a generator set, that's again, gonna dramatically uh, in, uh, de decrease the amount of KW potential for you, but all, and also add a number of significant components to the system. So once you get those all figured out and you select your generator set, now you're gonna be potentially impacting uh, your physical size, because now that you've derated, but you still needed a thousand KW machine, you're gonna to go to a bigger piece of iron. So you're gonna end up with a much bigger unit. You're gonna have more weight. And those are gonna drive the uh, packaging that uh, we've talked about and also some of the other requirements uh, that Mr. Kiever talked about. So we also need to look at the coatings. We need cart paint a lot of times for the generator sets and the materials on the unit that will be affected by wash down procedures. And uh, again, at the end, a lot of times we wait till the end after we figured all this out, figure out if the, the unit is going to be maintainable. Um, we're gonna be packed into tight spaces in these generator uh, packages, and we need to make sure that the maintenance is capable for the warfighter, um, that all the filters and all the uh, maintainability items on the unit are accessible. So that's another thing that gets often left off to the end, and it's a very important thing to be able to make these uh, long life machines. So again, I, I wanna stress that it's important to talk to your dealer uh, and early on in your development to, to set, the, uh, set the iron straight, make sure you pick the right size machine because that's gonna impact everything else you do in your program. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you Bucky for that information. Next up, we have, we have Hans Melberg. He is the sales application engineer, engineering manager for IEA, IEA LLC. IEA is an industrial cooling component manufacturer. Hans is a veteran of the United States Navy. He has over 30 years of engineering experience in product application and product management. Over to you, Mr. Melberg. Thank you, Sean. You know, looking at a couple of Bucky slides and he had, uh, he showed up. Uh, engine mounted radiator uh, genset package uh, where the fan is driven by the engine itself. Uh, fan will move a lot of air. It's a nice package. It will not fit in something like Nick had mentioned earlier and be able to be transportable. So you have to look at different cooling means to be able to do that. So when we look at that, we step back to the basics and then we look at a typical engine heat rejection uh, where the whole pie is your fuel consumption and energy in equals uh, energy out. So it all has to uh, in and out. So we have uh, work and it's the main reason that you are actually running that engine is to get that work power, rotational power, uh, KW out of the generator. Uh, the next big one is your exhaust. And that has to be handled in the exhaust system and tier requirements. So that's, that's going straight up to atmosphere through that system. The two major ones that you have to deal with in the cooling system is the jacket and oil heat and the AC or CAC heat. Now the jacket and oil heat are the, cooling the rotational items in the engine to keep that engine running at full power and 
under maintenance requirements. The AC is more of a flow system where all the engine manufacturers these days are using turbochargers where they're using exhaust energy through a turbine connected by a shaft through a compressor wheel and that compressor wheel is pulling air through the air cleaners and compressing that air. The compression is taking it up from atmospheric pressure and running it up to say 30 to 45 PSI. At the same time, that is raising that air temperature from say 77 um, ambient air up to 300 to 450, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that has to be reduced down to uh, 122, 113 at 77, depending on the emission requirements. And so you need a system to do that. So while you're cooling the jacket water and sending it out to a cooling system and running it through the tubes of a radiator and moving air through it, through the fin side, the CAC system, you could have a unit mounted heat exchanger that you run the air through and then it runs a coolant through and then you move that coolant out to a radiator system and, and cool it that way. The CAC portion of it is they take that compressor discharge hot air and run it out to uh, an aluminum charge air cooler, CAC in that case, um, that you need to blow air through. So you're taking that hot air through the tubes and then blowing the atmospheric air through the fin site and taking that back to the engine inlet. A uh, challenging part in, in most of these applications is trying to find a fan and cooling arrangement that can fit inside the package and actually cool the package in all the environmental conditions that we're trying to get into. Whether it's at high altitude, low altitude, whether it's cooling two cooling loop circuits or liquid circuits or cooling charge air circuits. And everything needs to be considered in there, but yet you don't want to move too much air or try to move too much air through an enclosure because then you're opening up louvers, you're making a lot of noise, and the whole system ends up being kind of a, a, a mix of uh, balance, I guess, of trying to move the right amount of air yet have the radiator design to cool in cold weather yet up at uh, hot, hot conditions and deserts and, and then have proper coatings on them just in case you get into salt water conditions uh, to protect the uh, uh, radiator from corrosion effects. Um, this one uses, um, uh, that's fine. This one uses a clutch uh, a fan setup uh, where it can control that airflow um, it has a motor on it, but the clutch is what's actually doing the airflow. So it, it can actually try to optimize the performance versus that, or you could use a VFD if necessary and you really wanted to uh, make adjustments that way. And go. Uh, trying to fit everything into an enclosure doesn't mean you have to go with a unit mounted radiator. You can you go with uh, cooling surfaces say up in the skin or wall of the enclosure and then fans in the roof and, and match up fans to the performance required by the surfaces that you're putting out there. And the top one is a charge air cooler and it requires one fan to move the air through that charge air cooler. Uh, since engines have two turbochargers or four turbochargers, two banks, you would put one on each side and two fans in the roof and pull it through that way. Uh, you're not moving air through the enclosure anymore. You're just moving it through the cooling surface. Likewise, the jacket water below uses two fans to pull the air through that jacket water and it's designed to be short stocky. In this case, it was up on the fifth wheel area where it could pull, um, it kept it real short and stocky and was able to pull the air through there. Uh, also with the coatings on it to keep it. But the um, 
it stopped the ventilation from having to go through the entire enclosure. Moving 100,000 through an enclosure that's a tight enclosure is pretty hard and will cause a pretty big pressure drop. That doesn't mean the enclosure doesn't have to be ventilated. So you may have to put in ventilation fans to pull the radiated heat off the block and off the generator and also move that to ambient. This is uh, very much an eye chart. Um, there's a lot that goes into selecting a cooling system, um, the internal flow rates of the tubes to make sure that we're not eroding tubes so that we have a long life product, uh, maintaining temperatures at low ambient all the way up to high ambient and altitudes and moving air flows. So um, systems can be looked at and should be looked at individually and try to optimize the performance and, and meet the requirements. Thanks, Sean. All right, thanks, Hans. And our last and final pre presenter before we get to the Q&A is, is Mr. Jay Harrelson. Jay is the director of Inside Sales at Celtron. Celtron is known internationally for electrical cable assemblies, wire harnesses, semiconductors, to name a few. Jay has over 30 years of experience in the military and aerospace market sector. So Jay, over to you. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, as you can tell from the previous pre presenters, uh, a, a tactical power generator includes a multitude of electrical loads and signals. Uh, Hans cooling system has motors in it, Nick's control and switching systems, even the gen set itself is provided by Bucky's team. All of these elements have to be interconnected within the overall electromagnetic profile of the system. So it's important to provide adequate EMI shielding in the cables and harnesses that do that interconnecting. Shielding requirements are typically expressed in terms of optical coverage, uh, it generally shows up on the harness drawings. Uh, the industry default is 85% uh, optical coverage, uh, but we routinely see requirements for 90% uh, optical coverage and even higher. Um, there are some things that should be considered in designing shielded cables and harnesses. One is the installation. If the installation requires a lot of complex routing with tight radius bends and twists, uh, the choice of shielding method and coverage requirements should be considered because some solutions are more, more flexible than others. Another design consideration is the overall geometry of the harness. End-to-end -end cables that go into big open spaces are generally very easy to achieve high levels of shielding. However, when you get into multi-leg harnesses, uh, with angled connectors similar to what you see on the right side of the, the photographs there. Uh, those can present challenges for shielding effectivity and usually require a little greater level of process control and diligence on part of the manufacturer. Uh, finally, there are some options in the shield material uh, itself in terms of platings that should be considered. The usual choices are the same as insulated wire and cable, that being silver, uh, tin, and nickel plating. There are some trade-offs associated with these uh, in terms of conductivity, uh, which contributes to the shielding effectivity, and the environment that they're going to exist in with regard to, specifically regard to temperature and uh, moisture, particularly if there's salt involved in the moisture. Uh, for example, silver is the most conductive, but it's the lowest, has the lowest temperature rating, and it has some risks in high humidity environments. Conversely, nickel is very high temperature, very robust material, but it's slightly less conductive than silver and uh, can result in a less flexible assembly, uh, uh, mechanically flexible, that is. So the design solution that provides the greatest flexibility, both literally and figuratively, uh, for compliance is the machine applied braiding that's woven directly onto the harness or cable, as you see in the upper right-hand corner. There are several process factors that we can manipulate to achieve the coverage requirements. Uh, the number of carriers in the braid machine, the size and quantity of filaments on each carrier in the braid machine, 
And then finally, the uh, application rate or how fast we pull the, the cable or harness through the machine. That results in uh, various number of uh, picks. They're referred to as picks per inch, which contribute to the, to the shielding effectivity. Then besides machine braiding, uh, designers can, uh, there are other methods designers can incorporate uh, conductive tape wraps. Uh, there's also pre-braided pre -braided slip on shield tubing. Uh, it's available in a variety of combinations of size, plating, wire gauge, so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course, there's always the uh, opportunity to combine those things. For example, it's, it's very common that we see tape wrap combined with braiding operations. So let's go to the next slide, Sean. Uh, the current solution for wash down compliant cables and harnesses is to jacket and overmold using EPDM rubber. There are some proprietary materials out there that, that claim to meet the requirement, but they're sole source products and they're typically not used or they're not widely used across the industry. Uh, EPDM is available in extruded tubing and raw compound that it's applied by a process called transfer molding, which is basically an injection mold but the material is vulcanized or cured uh, by high temperature and high pressure uh, versus simply cooling off like a thermoplastic. Uh, again, there are some considerations that should be understood in the design process for cables and harnesses that use this process. Uh, the more complex geometry of the mold shape, the harder it can be to achieve uh, an adequate repeatable fill. Uh, also, the tool has to be assembled and disassembled with every shot. So uh, the most ideal situation is a tool that has an even part line that can be simply separated uh, at the end of the shot. Uh, tolerance and location requirements are also something that should be considered. It's good to keep in mind that the materials we're talking about are things like wire and tape and other um, variable pro, uh, materials and they're typically uh, assembled by hand. So machine-like design parameters can drive cost and cycle time into the finished product. There are also some offer, options uh, that can be leveraged in this configuration. Uh, various hardware can be incorporated directly into these assemblies. Things like clamping points, mounting provisions and that sort of thing the material bonds very well to metal, so there's an opportunity there for the designer to incorporate some of these things directly into the harness uh, as we are assembling or as your supplier assembles it. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Nick and Sean and the rest of the engineering team for providing this venue, uh, and I hope that the participants got something out of our presentation today. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Jay, appreciate it. Now it's time for our Q&A portion. Remember, if you have a question, just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll try to get the, you to answer. Uh, if not, we'll follow up uh, with an email answer to you because we have uh, lots of questions to go through. Uh, the first one is uh, directed to Hans and it's dealing with, um, with salt in the atmosphere or in the air. So how do you keep a copper fan from corroding in an air, air correction, in a salt air environment? Yeah, we, we can use a couple different methods. And uh, one is uh, we can put a coating of tin on it. So it's a solder coat on top of the copper, which then um, minimizes that uh, exposure of copper to the atmosphere and the salt. Um, the second one is, is you can also hear a site coat over the top of that, and it's a phenyl coating that's baked on, and that provides a really nice level of protection for, uh, for both the copper and then also for aluminum, which can be hair site coat. Okay. All right. Our next question is, um, someone's asking Mr. Kiever pro 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 about programmatics. So programmatically speaking, what are the impacts caused by delays when you're trying to source a power solution? Well, 
we've seen several different things in the past. Uh, you know, one example I know that we ran into was weight. So similar to like what Bucky talked about, how you can go online to buy a car or something. You go online and you see a thousand kW generator and it has a weight associated to it. And then by the time you derate, you find out that that thousand kW generator doesn't make it. So you have to go up to the next level. <clears throat> and that increases your weight of that generator. So what that means programmatically is when we talked about the transportability requirements on how your envelope is already kind of dictated at a particular size, then now you've got a bigger, heavier generator set in there. So you get into a weight reduction initiative. And then you start getting into specialty steels, you get into things like titanium and the cost for the program just goes up and then that causes delays in and of itself. So that's an example, you know, it's why it's very important to look at this stuff as early as you can. So you have a clear understanding of what your program's gonna be impacted by it. Yeah, that's understandable. And it, it segues into the, to another question we have here. Um, and it, uh, piggybacking off what Nick just said is what is the typical design cycle time for a power for a tactical power system? Um, the, the cycle time depends on the level of complexity and the requirements. You could have something where a design could be in you know a month. You could have something or even very simple and few uh, requirements could be a week. But if it's a major program with EMI considerations, also having to have inter part interchangeability considerations and you know the bureaucracy that goes around with some of the um, different requirements for material selections, you could be into the multi-year tens of engineers working on it multi years to do the development. So it can range pretty big. And, you know, that's when you talk to, you know, a company like ourselves or some of the guys on the panel or other folks like that, they can kind of indicate from a initial read of a specification what you're looking at to help you plan. Okay. And is there a difference in design? When you talk about how long it takes from a military versus a government or correction, the military or government versus a commercial design? Yeah, the defense uh, industry takes uh, typically longer because of the requirements that are driven, uh, driven from it. I mean, we've done packages from, you know, something sitting outside a bank or on a hospital to an oil platform and a major data center, and then you have the defense applications, and they kind of range in that order. But typically, the defense applications uh, do take a significant amount longer just because of all of the, not only the design and development to meet the specifications, but also the qualification testing that they like to endure. Okay. The next question I have is, uh, it's, it, uh, it's for Hans. So it's in reference to cooling. So what is the relative size change when designing for a system at 5,000 feet, let's say, versus sea level? I don't know if we can be too relative on it because it's going to have a lot to do with the airflow of the, uh, of the fan and the fan's ability to do that. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, we, uh, we may have to move a little bit more air up at altitude to get it to cool, uh, which may put you in a larger motor, but yet you can't be in a larger motor. So you're gonna to have to play with the surface areas a little bit more to get it in there. So uh, it's very open-ended. Uh, we have some pretty good programs and predictabilities that we can look at if we get into specific applications to define sizes. And Bucky, is there a typical power D rate for operating at a higher altitude, let's say 5,000 feet or so? Sorry, I was muted. Every, uh, every engine has a little bit different personality, depends on its setup and application. I mean, most engines do pretty well up to 3,000 feet. Um, and then uh, they can dramatically lose horsepower as you go up in elevation. Um, it's not 100% cut and dry. Some specific number because some engines will you know lose power at a certain level you can't run them and meet their rating so 
Um, it's, it's something that, again, we like, like uh, Hans was talking about, we have sizing programs that can predict that for each engine. And uh, they have uh, the complex algorithms uh, plugged in to them behind the, behind the curtain, so to speak, and we can help with that. But, uh, you know, pretty much anything above 3,000 feet is going to have a, a good impact on the rating of the machine. Okay. All right. Our next question is dealing with the cable assembly. So I think, Jay, this one's for you. Are there industry standard, are there industry standard workmanship criteria applicable to EPDM cable assemblies? Uh, well, not specifically regarding EPDM. There are some general workmanship criteria included in the IPC standard, which is sort of the workmanship Bible across uh, the interconnect market. Uh, but they're very general uh, and, and apply to just any type of over molding. Uh, our experience is most of the time, if our customers have specific requirements, they're contained in uh, specific documents. So we, we tend to um, look for, for that kind of clarification rather than rely on industry standard. Okay. So our next question deals with buying from a generation from COT, so commercial off the, off the shelf generators. What do you see as the biggest obstacle in using general retail units in a tactical setting, especially when they're trying to buy a COT generator to fill a rapid deployment need? I can take this one, John. Uh, you know, I would say this is one of, this is a great question because this is one of the things that we see um, is, you know, it's back to the website thing. You see a package, it's got an enclosure, you get it from your uh, engine OEM and you need to get it out there quick. And what happens is the minutia of the requirements comes in. So the engine harness that comes on that car's generator may not be shielded to meet your EMI requirements. So you have to go in and then get with a company like Jay's and have it wrapped, special one. So, you know, the biggest obstacles in using COTS is the specification originally. So if you have a rapid deployment initiative, you know, I would encourage you to reach out to folks like the companies on this panel or other companies like us to work with you in developing the spec because there is trades. And what we see sometimes the biggest obstacles is the companies themselves, you know, because they have a reputation for producing sophisticated equipment out in the field and being able to minimize some of the requirements to allow for the use of COTS uh, impacts that. So, I mean, it's a great question. There's a lot of places that can go. And, um, you know, I would be happy to talk with you more about it if you want to reach out to me directly or one of the other panelists, I think would be too, if you've got a particular thing you're working on. Okay, Nick, thanks for that. So speaking of the uh, effectivity as far as the shielding goes, so is the shielding effectivity typically part of the cable acceptance testing, Jay? We can't hear you, Jay. Sorry. That was a brilliant answer, though. You missed it. I'm sorry. Yeah, you were shielded. <laughs> um, shielding effectivity is not an easy thing to measure. Uh, typically, we don't do that as part of acceptance. It's typically done, if it's done, it's done at a qualification or first article type setting. Uh, it's been our experience very often that our customers actually perform that testing, uh, whether it's at the component level like the cable or harness or uh, at a full system level, uh, which then brings into you know, challenges of problem solving if you have an issue with it. But uh, typically we don't do that at, at, at 100% acceptance level at the cable level. Okay. And our next question deals with uh, sound. So uh, I think this is for Nick. What are, your, what are the solutions you typically use to enhance sound attenuation in tactical generator sets? Uh, there's a couple different approaches you can take. Uh, it depends on the uh, amount of sound that your prime mover is outputting and then your requirement. Most typically, it's a mineral substance that is inserted into the walls of the enclosure with a perforated metal over top of it that allows for the sound to be hidden through that mineral wool that uh, has different, certain characteristics. 
and also a big thing is Hans kind of touched on in his is when you're moving a lot of air, when you open up areas that produces opportunities for sound to leak, right? So you want to try to minimize the amount of open area you have in the package, as well as your doors. You want to ensure that you have uh, good sealing methods around your doors and any access points inside the package as well. Okay. All right, our next question is either for, uh, I think it's either for Hans or Bucky. Uh, when does it become necessary to use a separate radiator for each circuit? So when you're talking to AC and the, the JW, when does it become necessary to use a separate radiator for each of those circuits? I can handle that. It, um, it all depends on how you're packaging. Um, you're gonna need separate circuits for um, the AC and the jacket. Um, whether you combine them into one radiator or not depends on uh, the, the allowable space you have to be able to do that. And as we've been talking, the air that's going to be required to flow through that package. So you say, well, we can, if we can separate them and put them in different areas, then we're minimizing that and helping out, as Nick said, on um, minimizing that open area required to get the air flow through it. So. Uh, a lot of times it's, you can also minimize uh, size of equipment. So um, it may take up a little bit more space on the wall uh, to put those separate items in, uh, but at the same time, it may fit your package a little bit better. So and then you will separate them. Okay. All right. We have a, a designing tactical power system question. Uh, this one's for Nick. So what is the most common issue you run into when designing tactical power systems that you see based on your experience? Uh, weight's a big one uh, because, you know, the warfighter is restricted on the equipment they have to tow and transport this equipment. So that becomes the first. So, you know, the when the unit is put together in terms of what prime movers are available for all the other equipment that the power is powering, um, usually that comes in first and then, you know, you become limited on the specification and the prime mover. So you do your gen set selection as Mr. Brennan talked about. And so you've got your start, your heart of the power package. You have your prime mover, which says it can only move so much weight and other transportability requirements may say it can only be so big. And that's really what you start with. And, you know, that's the first limiting factor that from a design point, you have to evaluate to see how you want to approach the custom solution. Okay, so as Han, so Hans, does the gen set output affect the radiator size at all? Uh, it can. Um, it, it's going to specifically because that power, as you go up in the power and you go up in that fuel consumption, uh, your percentages may stay around the same, but the power output goes up, the heat rejection goes up, so the package will get larger. Okay, Hans, thank you. And I'm looking at the board here. Uh, I have, there's one more question, and it's dealing with uh, radiator motors and the ability to start them remotely. So the question is, how do you start, remote start a radiator motor from generator auxiliary standby power? I, I can take that, Hans, if you want. Um, so I think what you're asking is, if you have a tactical unit and we have remote radiators in the in the system with a an AC motor, how do you get that started when you start your generator? Um, the generator, at least on initial start, will have enough fluid capacity to reject any heat that it might uh, generate during its startup process and getting to full speed. Um, and just the system itself will be able to handle that temperature. And once the generator is up and running and it's producing its, uh, you know, power requirement, whether it's 480, 4160, typically in a large tactical uh, power unit, there's a, an auxiliary transformer that uh, gets the voltage from the generator when it's up and running. And then that auxiliary transformer feeds a gener generator auxiliary panel inside the unit, which will power up through uh, motor starters, et cetera, uh, your different motors you might have in there, including the uh, radiator. 
fans. That that hit it, Hans. That makes sense. Yes, it did. It was okay. perfect. All right. So that uh, we clean the board off the, the questions that we have to ask. Are there any more comments that you guys would like to add before we we wrap up this session? I would just add, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to any of the panelists and their organizations. Uh, you know, the best thing if you're specifying a solution for the warfighter and you're at the front side of it is get help from the industry. Uh, you know, this one of the things I enjoy about working in this industry is it's very open to industry. So um, most companies are going to be more than willing to help you through your specification, even if you're not at the point you're buying anything yet. So that would be what I would leave everybody with is get the help early in your program. It's going to help out uh, your organization as well as put the best equipment in the warfighter's hands that we can. Okay. Thanks, Nate. All right. If there's no more questions. Thank you for the questions that you have asked up to this point. And if you have any more, feel free to reach out to the, the point of contact you see on the screen, there's their telephone number and their email addresses. So hopefully you have a better understanding of the complexities of integrating power solutions into your next project. With that, this concludes the importance of power integration webinar. Thanks again to our panelists for such an informative session. If you have any additional questions, please email me or the panelists. Also, please don't forget to complete the survey that you received via email on the end of this session. You will receive links from me to view and share this webinar in an email as well at a later date. So we hope you have a great week and stay safe wherever you are in the world.